be better. Absolutely. We love it. We're telling stories now. <laughs> <laughs> And after high school, I knew for a fact that I was unique in one way or another. My name is Chris McKenna and you're watching Singleton Stories with Biko Zulu. My dad was a very sharp dresser in one way or another because he loved his khakis and he loved his coats. And when I think about it, he was he was very stylish and his shirts. My grandfather, the father to my father, was extremely stylish like he will have those godfather hats that have a nice little you know feather in there so he was extremely stylish so i think i got it from them when i think about it but i always had a way of walking into us into a shop and deciding how to pair things up and, and for me shopping is always very very fascinating because every single day i get to discover how i want my look to be and now i've gotten into the whole bespoke suits and all those different things and it's just mind-blowing I think I will say between the age of seven and eight, when for me, very many things were just like, when I thought about it, it was a lot of arguments, but when I think about it right now, it was just me like really becoming unique. So small things like, my mom will tell me it's Sunday, you need to wear a dress, you need to wear a dress. And she had bought for me very, very many beautiful dresses, bless her soul. Um, and for her, it was no, on the other days of the week, you can wear whatever you want. But on Sunday, because we are going to church, wear this dress. And of course, sometimes I will say, okay, cool, cool, cool. Then I will survive church and immediately I'm back home. I just want to remove it and go into my t-shirts and my shorts. Then my dad started buying uniform for everybody at home. So if he goes into a butter, he buys safari boots for everybody. And he goes and he buys jeans for my bro and he also buys for me. And that made me extremely happy because those are the clothes that I loved, loved. So of course my wardrobe was my first flag. But now things just continue becoming louder and louder. So the games that I will choose to do, when girls are doing Kati pretend house, I will be on the other side doing cops and robbers with the boys. But uh, you know, the, my brother is driving and it's a matatu and I'm on the, behind the bike and that would make us absolutely happy. So in high school, I was I was suspended three times, and the and the reasons were constantly the same. It will be uh, today you've been found writing specific notes and love letters to a specific person. So we do not allow that in the school. Kindly go home, come back with your parents. The first time I went home, um, being suspended, nobody said a word. My dad didn't speak about it. My mom didn't speak about it. But of course, they expressed the fact that. We took you to school to go and get a, a good education. This is not what you're supposed to be doing. So the next time when you go back to school, please be very, very serious about what we took you to school to do. The second time, um, my mom was worried and it disturbed her And I, when I think about it. And she introduced me to see uh, a therapist. So for her, it was maybe I was going through so much and right now thinking about it, that was maybe her worry. So when I think about it right now, that was her way of trying to heal me. And so they agreed with the school, she will be going for therapy every once a week. Every single time that day of the week came, for me the excitement was I was actually leaving school. For me, I never looked at it as healing. For me it was let me leave school and maybe actually when I'm in therapy, I can talk about many other things that bother me. And the conversations that we had, had actually nothing to do with why I was suspended. So for her, it was just touching on many different things for, you know, what do you think gives you pain? What are the things that you will want to talk about more? What do you think you will want to tell your father? What do you think you'll want to tell your mom? What do you think you'll want to tell your friends in school? So it was, it was really around what the issue was, if that's, if that's what they were trying to do. And I did it for almost one term and, and everything was okay. And so it happened again, the third time I was suspended. And of course, this was a moment that even for myself, I said, okay, I need to think about this. I need, I need to think about what I'm feeling and what I'm going through. Because now there was a lot of shame that I was, you know, my parents and, and myself as well. And I was just like, let me think about this. And the third time when I went home, now my dad was very furious. He expressed himself, um, of course, still not talking about the issue, but just furious that I'm not being able to go through school the way he will want me to go through school. And, and, I, and I understood. I mean, any parent will feel the same way. But now this time around, I think my mom now leaned onto the church and they said, um, let's try and, you know, just remind you about 
religion and all those different things. And after that, I went back to school and I, I promised myself, you know, just to keep it together and to make sure that everything is okay until I'm done with school. And that happened. So finished my form four. And after high school, I knew for a fact that I was unique in one way or another. The kind of childhood that I had was a lot of conditioning. So my dad wants me to do this, then after this he wants me to become a procurement and logistics officer. So for him, it, he had already mapped out how he wanted my life to be. But I knew that that's not what I wanted my life to be. But because we've been taught to conform and conform and conform, I ended up constantly attending classes. But over time, I just kept on reading about different people in Nairobi who were making it. I kept on seeing Shiks Kapienga, People are doing big things in different stages in the Kenya National Theatre and I was like, wow, I want to be like these people. So one day I spoke to my brother and I said, Kim, come. Um, today I'm going to leave home, but I'm not going to come back. And he looked at me and he was like, what do you mean you're not going to come back? You know, that's going to be stressful. You know, mom is going to get so, so much, so many issues from, from dad. You know, dad is going to go crazy. So what are you saying? I said, no, because I think I need to go and do a couple of auditions that I've seen. If I'm taken, I won't come back. But if they say no, I will come back. But at that particular point, that chapter in my life, I knew I had to jump. So I went for classes, registered. But at 1 p.m., 2 p.m., I went down the stairs of, you know, that big building in Nakuru, went all the way down to the stage where different matatus used to take people to Nairobi. So there were the cheap ones for 300 bob. Then there was the ones for high-class people, which was 1,000 bob. So of course, at that particular point, I didn't have money. I only had a thousand bob. So I said, let me go to this ones. I uh, booked my ticket, sat in the matatu. And I remember that matatu took like one hour to fill up. And all that time, it was just constantly, do, do you just need to stop this, go back home just so that there's peace? But then still the calling, the calling is like, nope, you need to try. You need to try. If you fail, you come back home and you take everything that has happened. And of course, the matatu filled up, and boom, one night in Nairobi. Longest journey of my life. I've gone to Nakuru now. Every month I go down to Nakuru, but it has never been that long. <laughs> I had one agenda, to go to Alliance Francaise, because my friend Obilo worked at Alliance Francaise, and every time I looked at his Facebook, he looked very connected. He knew all these actors. He, he was constantly on the stage of hustling, so I was like, this is my guy. <laughs> if I don't find Obilo, I'm in problems. So I came. Uh, the Matatu went all the way down to Nyamakima and I was lost because I did not know Nairobi. But I decided I'm going to ask every single person where Alliance Francaise is until I get there. And this was around 5 p.m. heading to 6. Walked from Nyamakima just asking, where's Alliance? where's Alliance?" And very many people were just like, who are you? You don't know Nairobi and Ivy Pita in the 20th century. Da, 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 da. Marked my route through and through. Got to Alliance at around uh, 6 p.m about that time. When I got there, the guards were there and I was like, yeah, I'm here to see Obi Longongo. And they were like, who ni nani? Because I said Obi, actually, I said Obi. He ni nani? I said, anafanya kazi hapa? And I want to, and I want to see Obi. So they said, um, uh, we don't know someone by that name, but uh, maybe if you come tomorrow morning, I can be able to direct you to where Obi is. So I said, no, 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 I need to see him today. He said, everybody has locked up their offices, poor God. So at that particular point now, I didn't have his number. The only contacts that I had on my phone, and my phone at that particular point was going crazy. Because now it was past time for me to be home. My dad was calling, my brother was calling, my mom was sending messages, and it was like, where are you? This is not going to be an easy night. Everything was happening, and I was like, okay, let me switch off my phone just so that I can think straight for a minute. So they said, I need to come back tomorrow. So what do I do today? So I said, let me walk back just retracing my steps and how I came to Alliance. And I walked back and at that particular point, just maybe 2010, there were benches outside, 20th century. Nice benches. I sat there and I was just thinking to myself, it was like around 7, 7.15, 7.30, so it was a little bit dark. I had too many worries that I actually did not care about where I was going to sleep that evening. When I put on my phone, it's just going crazy. So I usually tell people I do not know how that night went but I sat outside a bench, outside 20th century, my first night in Nairobi. The night went and the morning came and nothing had happened to me. And at around seven, I walked back to Alliance Francaise and I was shown Obilo's office. 
and my journey began. Oh yes, actually I found Obi. So he went to introduce me to the different directors, Victor Bear, Sami Mwangi, and at that particular point, they looked at me and they said, Tessa, we might not have a role for you, but if really, really, really you want to do this, there are some guys here who might need someone to, you know, kidogo kidogo help them here and there in the wardrobe, nini nini, get for them some tea, some lunch. For that particular point, I met Shiks, I met Teacher Wanjiku, I met Larry Asego, I met Churchill, the big wigs. And I did very, very many different plays with heartstrings, you know, on stage and even traveling theater. And I am very, very blessed and very, very grateful to them because they molded my journey when I just got here. So I was spotted uh, by a director at Tidy High and they said, you know what, I think you've got talent. Come, let's try and give you a role. And that's now how McKenna came to be because McKenna is a name from Tahiti High. So I was the head girl in Tahiti High for over four years. Then after that, of course, I, I was still doing Tahiti High while going to school. So I went through KMC. Then after KMC, I went to KU. And after Kenyatta University, I got to be able to travel to America for some period of time to still continue doing a lot of acting and film. And after I came back, for me, it was, I'm done with my education now. What do I want to go into? So acting was there, but because of how the industry is, I said, let me try out what I've actually studied, film production, TV production. So I applied for a job at NTV and I got in. Stayed there for three years doing entertainment, you know, being a producer entertainment while, and then after that I went to the BBC just to continue doing what I wanted to do until the day that I decided to resign, yeah. How do you leave the BBC? <laughs> People thought I was absolutely crazy. It was scary for me, but now my family members were just like, you can't leave the BBC, you know? You know, just think about something, just take a sabbatical, do something, you know? My friends, my, my different colleagues, you know, just went like, yo. I mean, when I think about it, there was a lot of different reactions. People just saying, you don't leave the BBC, but for me, it's bigger than that, yeah. Beautiful story, actually. So Bold Network Africa started from just bold conversations. So I was seated and uh, having conversation with different people um, and Michelle was in the room and she says, uh, look, um, I think when I think about you, you're very, very bold, you know, and you don't need to wait for too long before you decide to do something that is actually going to help the community and, and people. So she said, why don't we think about something that is bold? And of course, over time we talked about it, talked about it, and three months into that conversation, Bold Network Africa was, was, was born. And so Bold Network Africa really actually is an acronym of brave, odd, loud, and different. Why bold is because people in the community are constantly told you're very brave. You're very odd, odd unique. You're very loud. So you're too flamboyant, you know, and you're very different. There's something about you that is so different. It can be your wardrobe, it can be how you express yourself, very different. I feel that Africa is where it is as a continent because of lack of education when it comes to some specific things. So there's a lot of laws that exist because we have not been able to educate people enough to understand why we need to push for some certain agendas. So the aim is to use storytelling, so documentaries, podcasts, fashion, many different things, just to be able to push for advocacy and educate people why. If today your son walks up to you or your daughter walks up to you and says, hey, this is who I am, I think I'm gay. Your first act is not going to be no, 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 no. But you have different things that we have shot and created that you can actually go back to and say, okay, let me take some time to actually understand and get educated when it comes to gender identity. Um, a few years ago, I, I think that was my fear. And so, even when articles and different things were written about me and the, and, the, and, the, and the headline is gay journalist, gay person, gay blah, blah, blah. I was like, no, there's more to it than that, you know? And so right now in my new journey, I feel like that, that, that will shift because for me, it really isn't about my gender identity. It's about what I am trying to do. The journey is bigger than who I am. 
and what I'm trying to do. So there's a time that that was something that bothered me a lot and I was like, no, 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 no. That is not how we're not supposed to tell the story. But right now I feel like the narrative is going to change. The narrative is going to change because it's a journey of being bold. Everybody in this universe has a moment of wanting to be bold. Everybody, even in making a decision, should I, should I wake up and go and sign this contract? It's a moment of boldness. But more even for the people in the LGBTQ community. That's what I'm trying to push them to do every single day when you need to make a decision to either to wear a shirt or a dress. And a shirt is what you want to wear, then please be bold and pick up that shirt because it's important. I think I, I'm, I'm afraid. And every single time I feel afraid, the universe gives me a reason to just seal that up. Like there are days I wake up and I'm like, wow, what's gonna happen? You know, I got calls from a million and one people just saying, how do you quit the BBC? You know, everybody wants to be in the BBC, how, how? But every single time that fear creeps in, there's a constant reminder from the universe why this is the reason and this is the season for why you need to follow your purpose and just, you know, lead, lead on in this journey, yeah. I love storytelling. Like I love being in spaces where people just give out different stories about almost everything and just laughing. I, I love I love a good time. I love a good time. I I love exploring, I love traveling. So just being in different spaces that just make me see the endless possibilities of what we imagine. So being in a log cabin in Nanyuki, you know, so it's something that will absolutely make me very, very happy. <laughs> Yo, I actually loved a boy. I'm not gonna say his name, but in 2011, I was in a relationship with a guy. I'm not even gonna say a boy is a guy. And beautiful relationship. I mean, um, the only thing that was a lie is that I was telling a lie. <laughs> but everything else, you know, worked out. Go for movies, nini nini, have conversations. But there are some situations which were a little bit hard because for me now, there was a force that was constantly fighting, 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 and just saying, um, you need to live your truth. Because if you don't live your truth, you might even end up affecting other human beings, thinking that you're protecting them. Because when I think about it right now, I wasted his time in one way or another, you know, and just constantly giving hope that this might be something in the future. But also a very beautiful friendship from that relationship to date. So I think those were the lessons. Those were the lessons. Just live your truth because you don't want to affect everybody in your journey. Be very honest. Um, kill secrecy. Put a little bit of fun in there. And give 100% when you've decided to, to love. I think I will say all round acceptance. That's my perfect world. Yeah. Where there's equality in every single thing that I see in the world. You know, women asking for equal pay. Just a perfect world where there's just love, equality, and respect. I can break it down to the most simplest way. There are times where you will walk into a room and someone will ask you, is it miss or missus? That is someone respecting who you are. Yeah. Just so that they don't mix, get it mixed up. And when it comes to the community, the queer people, just ask, so how should I address you? Because very many people decide what pronoun they want to go with. There is he, she, they, them. Myself, if you look at all my emails and all those different things, I sign off as they, them. Because for me, I've chosen the root of non-binary. Because I feel like gender is something that we have given a lot of glorification. But actually, as much as we will actually should glorify it and respect people for being a man, a woman, there are times that it has been used against us. When women try to get into jobs, what if you did not have to put the female name, Christine, and you just go by Muriti? Maybe you'll end up getting that job. Hmm. I think it's one dream that is going to carry very many different things there. Because I, I want to own a jet, you know, 
<laughs> many different things. So I want to have a very, very good life. But at the end of the day, when, when I go back home in that jet, I want to be able to look back and say my dream has been achieved because when I think about it, there are very many people who have said because of what you have done up until now, I am who I am. I own this company. I am CEO. I have employed people. I am pushing inclusivity and diversity because the story started with you. Biko, <laughs> you've killed me. I want them to say that they lived their truth. They lived their truth. A double, the splash of water.